The American spirit dwells within each and every one of us. Today's episode is one that will inspire and bring forth that inner patriotic soul that we each and everyone share. When we see the stars and stripes flying, we rise, chest swells, heads back, eyes sometimes fill with tears. Today's episode will give you all of those feelings and more as we meet a very, very special man, Mr. K.O. Irwin. Mr. Irwin is a hero, a real American hero. The USS Indianapolis left San Francisco Bay just after dawn on July 16, 1945. The mission was deemed top secret, so secret in fact that the ship was traveling unescorted through the Japanese and shark invested sea. Her mission, unknown to the crew, was to deliver the atomic bomb that would be dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima three weeks later by Boeing's B-29 Superfortress, the Enola Gay, the most sophisticated propeller-driven bomber to fly during World War II. On July 26, the lethal cargo was successfully unloaded on the island of Tinian. The next orders received would begin a journey that would become the worst naval disaster in the history of the United States. Orders were for her to sail to the island of Guam and then to the Laity Gulf in the Philippines in preparation for the forthcoming invasion of Japan. Still, the heavy cruiser had no escort. This was a handicap to the vessel, which had no underwater sound equipment. Command had told Captain Charles Butler McVeigh III that he did not need a destroyer escort. This refusal was confusing to the captain due to the fact that no capital ship lacking anti-submarine detection equipment had been ordered to make this voyage without an escort during the entire war. Also withheld from Captain McVeigh was the information that a Japanese submarine had sank a destroyer escort, the USS Underhill, on this path shortly before the ill-fated departure from Guam. It was 14 short minutes after midnight on July 30th as the vessel was midway between Guam and the Laity Gulf when she was struck by two torpedoes fired by the I-58 Japanese submarine. The first torpedo of the six fired struck on the bow of the USS Indianapolis. The second struck near midship on the starboard side right next to the fuel tank and a powder magazine. The explosion split the ship. Within 12 minutes, she sank, going down by the bow and rolling starboard. Why was no rescue immediately dispatched? It was only an act of God that brought a PV-1 Ventura bomber at the right time, at the right place to see the oil slick on the water and the souls therein praying for rescue after four and a half days. Besieged by shark attacks, starvation, and terrible thirst, suffering from exposure and their wounds, the remaining men of the USS Indianapolis were at last rescued. Of the 1,196 men aboard the USS Indianapolis. It is estimated that approximately 900 of those men survived the explosion and went into the ocean. Of those 900 at the time of rescue, only 317 survived. This is one survivor's story. Thank you for joining us today on Those Who Serve, and I'm having a morning cup of fresh water with my best friend, Mr. K.O. Irwin, who has graciously invited us into his home this morning. Thank you, Mr. Irwin, for having us. You're more than welcome. 
project, you could be here. Such an interesting story I've learned about from some people out in the community, and I wanted to come spend some time talk with you about your naval history. But before we do this, March the 1st, 1925, Mr. Herbert and Miss Anna Laura Irwin welcomed a bouncing baby boy into their home. What happened 17 years later? I don't know. You'll have to ask them. I, I was trying to convince them to let me join the Navy to find my brother. Oh. So. Uh, and he had joined the Marines a little earlier. He had joined the Marines and he was in, in the Solomons and Cape Glasgow and I thought it had a big brainstorm. I could uh, join the Navy and go island from island and try to find him. Well, were you successful? Did you find your brother? My brain didn't work right. <laughs> turned out he'd already caught malaria and on, over in Australia. And I was still hopping islands aboard the USS Indianapolis looking for him. Aboard the Indianapolis. Now, the USS Indianapolis was affectionately known as the Indy Maru. Is that correct? That is correct. And you served on the USS Indianapolis for two years and four months. Absolutely. That was my home. That was your home. You didn't leave the ship very often, did you? No, we stayed on the water just about all the time. We did get to come in for a break or so every now and then, but very few leaves. Now, the Indy Maru served 10 missions, and you were a part of eight of those missions. That is correct. I started at Tarawa, the Marshalls, the Marianas, the Gilberts, Saipan, Tinian, Guam, Iwo Jima, Iwo Jima, and hit at Okinawa with a suicide plane. It took eight lives and wounded 39 people. So after we got hit, while they sort of patched us out, the, the suicide plane hit on, on the port side, back at, on the main deck aft, and went off, and the bomb went down through and blew the evaporators out, where we couldn't make any more water. So we got patched up and then went back to Mary Island to, to uh, get ready to go back out. So the Indianapolis had already been attacked once. A kamikaze pilot had hit the ship, damaging it to where you had to go back to port and have it fixed. And then you began yet another voyage. You received orders again. We did. Uh, after we took a shakedown cruise while we went back to, I believe it was Hunter's Point, and picked up component parts of the atomic bomb which we knew nothing about what was in the cargo or anything. It was a secret run that we carried it out to Tinian, which was put off and put, a, put aboard the uh, Nola Gay. Okay. And there where it was taken and dropped on Japan over there. So immediately after you were repaired from that, you left San Francisco on July 16th and headed for Tinian Island. Now, that secret cargo that you didn't even know you carried, there were only two men aboard the Indianapolis to load that secret cargo. That's how secret it was. You were one of those men. Yes, uh, I operated the crane along with the first mate. I was coxswain, and we operated the crane at uh, uh, picked up our supplies and also uh, picked up the uh, scout planes that we put on the, the catapults. And the first mate, well, after we'd train the planes out, well, the first mate would go out and load the, with the charge and everything. And then he would uh, tell the plane the pilot to rev up his engine and it hit kneel down and shoot off at it, shoot it off and the plane would go out and search for us and spot for us. Okay. So you have an actual model, a replica of the Indianapolis here. And uh, these are some of the planes and there wasn't a long runway on the ship. 
the planes were actually on catapults that, that projected them out into the ocean, into the air. That is correct. Okay. And then after you would, they would go out and spot for you and radar and pick it up and then, of course, if you was 10 foot shorter or sideways or what it is, well, they'd radio it back and then finally you'd get a direct hit on it. And after they would secure from uh, spotting force and everything, they'd come along, back alongside the ship and and taxi alongside the ship and we'd turn the crane around and I'd drop the ball and the photographer would take out his little hook, hook it up and I'd put it back and set it on the quarter deck. Okay, so here's the crane. That is correct. And you picked up this mysterious cargo which was the atomic bomb and half of the uranium owned by the United States at that time was also in that cargo. Well, and we you put it up there. We did not know that. You didn't know? We, we didn't know what we was picking up. We thought it was supplies or something. Okay. But there was no way of me knowing that it was in there. Or anyone aboard ship, plus Captain you. All right. Then the Indianapolis departs for Tinian Island. That is correct. That trip, 5,300 miles was made in record time, I understand, without an escort. That is correct. Now, an escort was a ship that would accompany the carrier that was more of a battleship. It had the submarine anti-submarine uh, detection equipment. Your ship didn't have that equipment. No, it did not. So there was no way to know if there were subs in the area. And the area that you were traveling into the Pacific Ocean down to Tinian Island was infested with Japanese submarines, sharks. It, it was a rough area, but yet there was no accompaniment, no escort. No, there was not. And uh, after we got to Tinian Island, put it out, and we asked for escort to carry us to uh, As you were on your way to Laity Gulf. Laity. Uh, we was headed for Laity. That's, that's when we had, uh, asked for the escorts also, but they had none for us, so we was traveling by ourselves. Still in those dangerous ocean waters, still by yourselves. Now, it was very odd that you did not have an escort. In fact, Captain McVeigh requested an escort. And he was denied the escort, but also he was not uh, shared information that a Japanese sub had sank a destroyer and carrier uh, before you guys left Guam. He was not uh, given that information. That's exactly right. And, uh, he had no he had no idea on on uh, at the uh, Japanese had already sunk a. Uh, D.E. Now, a little before midnight on the 30th. That is correct, 30th of July. Yes, sir. 1945. Some of the men had even gone up on deck to sleep because your ship didn't have air conditioning. It's made of steel. And the captain had said, We don't need to do the zigzag maneuver any longer. Some of the guys had gone up on deck to sleep even, in their skivvies to cool off, I understand. And something happened. Yeah, they, well, it, the low decks was just, there's no way you could sleep in your quarters down there. It's just entirely too hot down there. And uh, most all of them slept upside. I swung, swung a hammock right under a 40-millimeter uh, mount. Of course, you had to take it down for the every morning, put it up every night. And I slept in a hammock up there. I'd been on the ship over two years, and I had me a certain place up there. But they'd be sleeping all over the decks due to too hot. In fact, your water coolers, it, it was hot as the coffee that you would drink in there. And so many on the board ship, 
on a peacetime ship like this carries around 280 to 300 and uh, we had 1197 aboard when we were hit by two torpedoes. Okay. Two torpedoes. The torpedoes, I understand, the first one hit on the bow. Hit on the starboard side on the bow. Okay, and then the second torpedo hit where there was a powder magazine and um, it caused a great explosion. An eight inch powder round. Uh, our main battery on this size ship is an eight inch gun. Next one is a five inch gun, which that was my job. I was a rammerman on a five inch gun. And uh, it hit the main magazine and just blown it half into, what's it say? Okay. The ship sank within about 12 minutes. Yes, and uh, I run to the starboard side after I come out of my hammock and it listed real bad. So I carried a big knife on me. We all carried knives. And I started cutting the life jackets down and passing them out around. Uh, this is called a best of, which is 20 millimeters in here. And life jackets was tied around the side. And we started packing up. Passing those out and then finally listed so much while I run down the side. He said, You better get off, Irwin. And I run down the side and I dove in and swum as far as I could away from it. And the last thing I saw was it just pitched up. I just saw the fan tail going down and under and a bunch of my shipmates jumping off. Okay. You had your KPOC life vest. Yes, I did. No water, no food, and you had just literally just awakened, jumped out of your hammock when all this occurred so quickly. Yes, uh, uh, we just bunch. Uh, the next morning we started gathering around. All this bunch, it was about 250 to 300 of us. In this one group, it's just in K-Pock life jackets. But there were a few nets and things got off on the other side and floated a different way. And when they picked us up, uh, out of the 250 to 300, there's 56 of us. We were picked up by uh, PBY, flown by uh, Lieutenant Adrian Marks and his crew. He landed out there in tough water, he wasn't supposed to, to uh, land in the water, and, but the water was so rough, but he saw the sharks attacking the men. He landed his uh, uh, plane out there and he would taxi around and you'd swim, swim between the pontoon and the fuselage and they'd throw you a line and pull you in. After they got so many in the plane, about 15 or 20 of us, why, they shut the engine off and started putting us on the wing of the plane and tying us down with parachutes. Anything to get you out of the water? Oh, yeah. Well, it was awful rough, rough and they tore us, uh, took it down and tied us down and all. And uh, uh, after after uh, they got us all, about four o'clock in the morning is when the DE come, the story has to go, Cecil J. Doyle, and they started taking us off of the plane and putting us on the Cecil J. Doyle. And uh, uh, Cecil, J., Cecil J. Doyle, uh, men aboard ship, they give us their bunks, and, and after they hosed us down, we was all covered with oil and it up your nose and you'd eat out around on your arms under here where the life jacket had, had uh, rubbed in the salt water, solid yeah. sores. 1,196 men were on the vessel when she first departed. It is estimated that 900 men went into the water when she was destroyed. 317 survived of those 900 who went into the water. That is correct. 
four and a half days, you were adrift on the ocean. Men were found in a 20-mile area because of ocean currents, etc. That's right. 56 of you were found. How did you survive four and a half days without food, without fresh water in that environment? Well, we could we prayed, we prayed for in the daytime it gets so hot on you to pray for a night and it gets so cold. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. It gets uh, so cold you pray for daytime. Uh, you could see planes that would be flying so high but they uh, couldn't see your head sticking out of the water. You just have to keep your mind on you just gonna come home or is going to make it and everything. Try not to go about your thirst, but you would get real, real thirsty. And hunger did not bother me as much as uh, the thirst for water. The planes couldn't see you. These planes that were flying over you were flying how high in the air? Oh, I, I, I have no way of knowing. They just, you barely see them up there. Barely see them. They were that far up. You could hear them before you could spot them. Okay. And it was actually a fluke accident that Lieutenant Wilbur Gwynn was flying over the area where the Indianapolis had disappeared because no one knew the Indianapolis was gone, did they? No. It was such a secretive mission and the, the communication was flawed when the ship went down. Apparently, the ship's mate said that he did send the distress message, but it was ignored on the other end, and it was received by other areas, but also they didn't react that quickly. Yeah, see, when you, when you know, of course, we was on the radio silence and everything, but when you get to, it's supposed to take you from where we was at three days to get there. Well, 72 hours, we wasn't mustered in at uh, Lake Tee's mm -hmm. Gov. We were supposed to be mustered in there in Lake Tee, and we wasn't mustered in. And only reason they haven't started looking for us after then, after 72 hours and all, well, they was going to send us to meet up with the 5th Fleet. And they got to looking for the Indianapolis, and the Indianapolis was sunk. And they, that's why it took so long try to get somebody that, that didn't get us out there. Yes, they went to sleep on us in Lake Tee Gulf and not mustering us in there. But we didn't muster in, but they should have notified. They should have notified that that ship is missing, but it didn't happen. No, not at all. So Lieutenant Gwynn happened to have an antenna on his airplane, and that antenna was not functioning properly. So it just so happened that he walked back and opened the bomb bay doors and while he was working to fix that antenna, he looked down and he saw an oil slick. And now his job was to look for subs. He saw this oil slick and you mentioned he didn't see the men in their K-pop jackets at first. He came around and looked. Why couldn't he see you guys? Well, there wasn't nothing sticking out but your head out of the water. And uh, he just didn't see us and then he, he flew real low and swooped down on us and then he saw us. Yeah, the jackets were a tan beige color. It's grayish. Grayish color, so they sort of mixed in. And the jackets were so waterlogged after being in the, there so long that only your head was sticking up. Yeah, see, a, a K-pop life jacket's only good for about 72 hours. And when he spotted us, we had been already been there 122 hours, uh, and uh, we just uh, uh, it's just barely a head sticking out in that group, and there wasn't but 56 of us out of that 250 left that the sharks had taken their part and their toll, and, and after a man or anyone drinks water and. He, sun hits him and everything, they go berserk and want to go fight you or they see things, they see a hot dog stand 
or they see the ship come back up, we go get the ship, and then they'd, when you discover it's oil, they'd think you was a Japanese and start attacking you. So and the men were delirious from sure. drinking salt water in their condition, and they started seeing all types of things. Imagine it, things yeah. that, that uh, just wasn't true, and you'd talk to them and try to discourage them and tell them, no, no, that's not. There's no land there, and, and just uh, they wouldn't believe you or nothing. You start trying to pull them back or something. They just start swimming off and take off their life jackets, going under. It wouldn't be seen no more. Mm -hmm. Did you recover some of the life jackets as we did? Your peers would. We did, and we used them to try to get up on them, make a little float out of them or something. Of course, the people that few life rafts got off. I, uh, of course, I didn't see them. They were done drifted off and all, but that's where a lot of the fights and things would start. Well, you you've took too much time in the life raft, and it's my time to be in the life raft. And then when sharks would come around, so many would try to get in the life rafts. That was. That wasn't, well, the people just saw their head. Yes, which is understandable under those conditions. Sure. Severe, severe conditions. The oil, many men were injured coming off the ship when it was struck. Sure. Men were covered in oil from where the ship exploded. They were burned, some very badly. 300 in your group, 56 survived. That is correct. You were one of the survivors. Yes. How, what do you attribute your capability of not succumbing to delirium, not succumbing to a shark? Well, we'd pray and try to keep our mind off things had the desire to get back home and make sure your brother's all right, your mother and all. It's just manpower, I guess you call it, or whatever it may be, just uh, wanting to live. And, of course, the good Lord was with you at all times. He sure was with me and the other 56 that come along. And uh, after we once got on the plane, well, they'd give you just two sips of water and a little old cup and just had oil all on it for it. They'd pass it down through there. And everyone was honest, just took their sips and passed it on. No one took more. No one. Uh, see, the highest officer that's left in the group, he was in charge, it's Dr. Haynes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he is Lieutenant Haynes, and he, he he's, one, he's the one that put the cup in there. You'd pass it down the wing or whatever it may be. Okay. And if you'd already had your two, and then he'd come pass it on down there till you passed it to all of them. So and of course, okay. after you got on the uh, Cecil J. Doll, all they'd give you is a little broth. and. Just so much water. Mm -hmm. Dr. Haynes knew that after those conditions, you you didn't want to take in a lot of food or water immediately, that it would have adverse effects. So he rationed two ounces for each man, and each man was honest, didn't take more, e even though I'm sure the desire was there to just drink, yeah, drink just and drink. Take it, but they didn't. Yeah, it's just. Uh, Drank it too fast, you don't know what, what could have happened. They just ration it out to you. So the brotherly love was still there. You didn't take more from your brother no. who was beside you. Oh, no. No, you, you don't do that. That's special, special kind of man. Thank you. And we're going to talk about Captain Charles Butler McVeigh, who later was tried. 
He survived the ordeal and he was tried saying that he did not hold the zigzag pattern and he did not announce abandoned ship. You guys stuck up for him. What did you think? Uh, Captain McVeigh, it wasn't his fault. He tried to use him as a scapegoat to, to cover up for those 800, those, uh, 880 men lost at sea. He, uh, I tell you, if Captain McVeigh and all of us was aboard any time on the ship, we, we would go back to sailing on him at any time. He was just a good captain and all. And he was treated very, very wrong. And, uh, even after the war, after they were through the court martial and everything through the war, they uh, court martialed him. He'd get so much hate mail and everything. And in 1968, he committed suicide. Oh. And he took his own uh, Navy revolver and killed himself on his front porch due to all the hate mail. And that man was, that captain was a great captain. And I, like I said before, I'd say I'll learn him again at any time. He just was treated wrong. They even went so far as to fly Japanese sub commander Hashimoto over here to testify against Captain McVeigh. They did. And they did. you and your brothers showed up to testify for Captain McVeigh. Yes, they just used the most of them that was on duty when the ship got down to use the testimony. We all got behind him. It took us 50 years to clear his name to get him exonerated. So finally he was, but yet it was too late. In 2001, I believe it was, or 2001, we finally got him exonerated. So now he has honorable records for his service time. Yes, he had a few run-ins with some higher-ups uh, beforehand, Admiral I won't call his name. Different admirals and things, and they had it in for him, and they just laid this on man. And they should have got the people who did not muster us in at uh, at Leyte at Leyte in the mm -hmm. Philippines. It's mm -hmm. just a very sad thing about that captain. Wow. Well, the charges. Finally exonerated. Yes. Unfortunately, Captain McVeigh did not receive this before his untimely death. Yes. Uh, well, we started these reunions in 1960, and he was in there. We just have him every five years in, and uh, McVeigh only made uh, uh, two of those, I believe it was. For, for the, he committed suicide. The reunions. Here is a picture. This was your 69th reunion in 2014, and this year, 2016, 71 years. And this is my new cap for 71 years. I'll be proud to wear it and tell them I served aboard the USS Indianapolis. Yes, sir. I won't hesitate on that. No, sir. Wear it with pride. 71 years. How many of you gather now? Well, there's only 22 of us left, and uh, for approximately 14 or 15 shows up. The rest of them, bad health and all. Not that we're all in good health, but some of us can make it and some can't. Well, and I understand there's stories told at these reunions, and some of these stories uh, are quite humorous. Now, at 17, and you were 19 when the Indianapolis went down, but uh, 
quite a good looking young man and here's a picture of you and you weren't spoken for back home no no I was I was searching there was a few things went on now I understand they had this uh, particular nickname for you what was that it was they named me Radar Radar why would they call you Radar <laughs> they said I'm going with him. He'll pick up anything. He'll pick up all the girl. Says, uh, just look for old Kale. <laughs> he'll find it. And I did. I see one on each arm. I said, well, can't you give me a little help? <laughs> but, uh, it was a little funny. This guy from California told on me. But of course, my, well, by that time, my wife and I, and all we were married 56 years before she passed on. No, 56, 62 years. This was, was, was 56 years we had been married. And she was 60, we were married 62 and a half years. Wow, and that 62 and a half years provided you with a handsome son who followed in your footsteps in the Navy, serving on the USS Denver. He sure did. We, I'm very proud of him, and I also have a daughter, and I'm very proud of her. And things turned out wonderful after I met Thelma, that's my wife's name, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just a wonderful family. Awesome. What a blessing. What a blessing. You kept your country free. You served. You gave your life to that freedom. And now, what would you tell young people today? Well, I, I served the country and everything, enjoyed serving, but it's uh, people I think about, it's uh, gas I left at sea. It gets to me a little bit, but I'd like to tell the young people <coughs> that uh, there's no free lunches in the war and nobody wins in the war. You better look around and do the best you can, stay in school, and if you're ever called to serve, volunteer, you'll find out that you can learn quite a bit. I am a dropout from school. I did not get no higher than the eighth grade, but I I hope and pray that all young people take care of their schooling and get to school and then do something for your country. I think that's a great message, Mr. Irwin. Thank, thank you, you for sharing it with us. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your morning with me. Oh, this is a pleasure. It has been most an honor, sir, to sit here beside you. Yes. And to drink our fresh water. Absolutely. We can appreciate having this fresh, clean water in the United States. Sure can. And we do have good water. Yes, sir, we do. The best. Here's to you. And you, sir. Thank you. This is Paula Stennett for those who serve sitting beside one of the greatest men I've ever met. As always, God bless America, and it's a great day to be in the city of Fort Oglethorpe.